Yeah, Basie was a wonderfully down-home kind of person, and uh, one of the one only time really, I'd been at a couple of recording dates, this was relatively late in the game, and at the recording dates, you know, uh, I really became aware of what a terrific editor he was, because you know, one of the things about Basie's music, both his playing and the band, is that there is never anything unnecessary there. It, it is very, you know, it, it, in a sense, it's very pure. It doesn't have any frills. It doesn't have any, you know, pretentiousness. He just won't take that out. So, in, at this session, which was relatively late, I think they were doing Basie Goes Broadway or something like that. And uh, the arrangements were with various people, Chico Farrell's one that I remember, but there were others. And with these things, when they ran through the arrangements, uh, Locke Joe Davis was the uh, straw boss at that time, they ran through the arrangements, Basie would say, you know, and this here says, we don't really need this, do we? So he would pare down these things until they wound up sounding much and working much better, you know. But he did that with very few words, just in the case. Another time I got to see him in action was, at, I mean, we may have talked about that already, was the famous session of the Ellington and Basie band together, which if we haven't talked about, we, we probably should. We, we, we did. About yeah. it from a, a Duke point of view, but what do you remember about Basie's presence? What I remember about Basie was how deferential he was to Duke. I mean, it was really that, and we know that, that he greatly admired Duke, but he really was, Duke would almost have to, you know, force him to do things at the piano that he wanted him to do. The one I remember where he was actually, Basie was actually right because Billy Strayhorn was there too. And, but Duke also had something interesting in mind. He wanted to do, Basie to do the piano on A train. And Basie just refused. He says, you gotta, if you, if you don't want to do it, you gotta have Billy do it, but not me, you know. And the other thing was between the two bands, you know, it was the, the two big bands unusual in a recording studio to say the least. They had the bands on risers and the one on each side and the drums were in the middle and between those two and the uh, the reeds were on the bottom row and the brass uh, then the trombones and the, uh, and the trumpets. But it was done on risers and they were, you know, uh, roomy enough that the native didn't feel confined and there was nothing precarious about being on these things. But it was interesting to see and the engineers of course had a lot of work to do to balance everything. But what I want to say is that because the last number that they did was jumping at the woodside and when they come to the uh, Closing passages, you know, where the where the trumpets go, bra bra, and I want to show Basie's trumpet guys stood up, and I was quick at the Ellington guys. They were kind of looking. So I mean, they were playing, but they were kind of looking at that. After uh, eventually, they got up too. And that was like a, a, a minor <laughs> victory. <laughs> the Ellington Band well, as you know, was a very peculiar organism, whereas the Basie, you know, everybody was really good friends, and they were, you know, like a like a unit. Not talking musically, but but personally. Uh, so that was Basie. It was the two times that I really saw him, but the one time that. I got him, you know, sort of close up was, there was a town hall concert, which was one of these all-star things. And I Roy was on it, and, Marta, and Coltrane was on it, and Basie was on it. And at the end of the closing thing, uh, they did one o'clock jump. And that was when Roy said to me afterwards, he said, he said, you know, I was always, you know, I was wondering about Coltrane, he said, but when we did One O'Clock Jump, 
and he played, he went like this. <laughs> I knew he was one of us. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, you know, was in charge. And also it ran overtime, and the town hall was very particular about that because like most places, concert halls, they had to pay overtime union scale to, you know, to the stagehands and whatever was working there. And there was a concert series, and it had been one not too long before with George Shearing, when Shearing temporarily had this big band, which was mostly brass, you know, and, uh, and it ran over time, and they dropped the curtain on music, you know, which was there because, you know, George is blind. He didn't even see the curtain drop, you know, and, uh, so that was there. But the basic thing went over time, too, and I, to, I was backstage, you know, afterwards, and the stage manager came up to me and said, uh, you know, it was going overtime, but I couldn't drop the curtain on you, Mr. Basie, you know, so I <laughs> But Basie was in a, in a good mood, and I was with, uh, I forget who I was with, a small number, maybe a couple of friends, and one of them might have been a pretty girl, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, Basie said, uh, and I, I didn't really know Basie that well, but I had, you know, I've had some interaction with him. And so he said, uh, why don't we go uptown and go up to my place, you know, which is Count Basie's, you know. So he hailed a cab, we got into a cab, there were only about four of us, including him, you know, and we went up to Basie's. I had been there before. It was a very cozy place, actually. And, but he wasn't there that often, so when we came in with him, you know, that was like a, a great entrance. And that, but on the way up, you know, in the cab, we talked a little, and it was, a, and he was so, you know, like I said, he was a real down-home guy, you know, no airs whatsoever, you know, really very, very uh, warm and, and friendly. And he had a very good sense of humor. When he was near the end, when he was in a wheelchair, you know, and uh, there was a concert in Newark with the band, and the MC uh, was saying something, you know, it was the second half of the concert or something, and they said blah blah blah, and uh, he said something about, you know, now, you know, we want to hear from uh, Count Basie. You know, and Basie was in the wings in the uh, wheelchair thing, so he said, you know, and the, the, the guy was like saying, you know, and here he is, Count Basie, you know, and Basie said, well, he said, you have to wait a little for me, you know. <laughs> so like a guy expected him to step up, you know. But he was very good at handling that too with the, with the wheelchair. Um, no. It's like his music, no frills, you know, it's straight ahead. Uh, if people, you know, his piano playing was so, it, it, it's really marvelous what, what he does, even when he just plunks a few notes because of the time he has, and also the sound he gets from the piano. But if you want to know how much he could actually do if he wanted to, there is that early thing, Prince of Wales, with the Benny Moten band. Jesus, you know, I mean, he's all over there, you know. So he could do it, but that's like the editing. And that's like, you know, the, the, the basic music is really like the 1930s is the age of streamlining, and it's, it's streamlined music, that's what it is. No bumps. Nothing unnecessary to all that. The new stuff, I mean, as we're talking, the uh, savory stuff is coming out, and there's some really wonderful bassy there, live bassy. Amazing. <laughs>